Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie Yu, and today's talk is going to be about speech recognition. So I just want to introduce uh, the history of speech recognition, uh, exactly how it works, and why this is relevant to us today. So just a simple definition of speech recognition. As you can see on the image, it's uh, uh, a three-step process, speech, speech recognition, and then speech transcription, or simply known as uh, speech to text. And then our story starts in the 50s. Uh, specifically, in 1952, in uh, Bell Labs, they uh, pioneered uh, speech recognition in a software called Audrey. And Audrey is short for Automatic Digit Recognizer. And as you can see, it's the same three steps as before, where uh, the human is outputting speech, the software machine is recognizing speech through that microphone and through the, the actual software itself, and it's transcribing that speech on that monitor to the right, where you see that number two. And Audrey is short for Automatic Digit Recognizer because it recognizes uh, 10 digits, and you can probably guess uh, the digits are one, zero through nine. And we go to the 60s, where in 1962, IBM made its own software that could recognize speech called Shoebox. And it was a minor improvement. So instead of recognizing only 10 words, it could recognize 16. So 10 digits on top of uh, six command words, such as plus, minus, uh, multiply. So it could also do uh, mathematical functions. So if you were to say in 1962 and you had a shoebox in front of you, you could say one plus one and it would output two. So how these technologies work um, back then was uh, it has a speech unit and then these speech units are split up into tiny phonetic units. So for example, the word full stack we could split that up into its tiny phonetic units that the computer would parse and then put back together uh, to be able to recognize that word. So for example, full stack would be something like full stack. That's a very, I butchered it, but something like that. Um, and then put it back together to understand it. And then we have the 70s. And actually, a lot of uh, improvements came in the 70s, and the P Department of Defense and the U.S. government really poured a lot of money uh, into speech recognition, and they built upon um, the pre-existing systems to build a more robust uh, brute search force algorithm. So it's basically the same uh, system as we saw before with the phonetic units, except uh, these phonetic units are mapped um, with a node system. And in during the 70s, uh, the size of this node map was about 15,000 nodes, was uh, the largest that they could get, up, get it up to at that time. And that enabled uh, speech recognition to go recognize 16 words to 1,000 words. And it's basically just uh, when you utter a speech, it just kind of maps it along the node map uh, until it recognizes it. And then it, it spits that back out and transcribes your speech. And uh, more improvements came in the 70s with the hidden Markov model. So this algorithm really gave a huge boost to speech recognition. And it's basically just a complex uh, mathematical uh, system algorithm that uses uh, probability. And this hidden Markov model was the basis of speech recognition for, from the 1970s to the 2000s. And how it works is basically uh, you're given a word and it's a chain. And then each, if you notice this chain, uh, each node is uh, the, the phonetic units that the, the word is made up of. And then the nodes are connected by a link and this link is called a phenome. And the numbers assigned to these phenomes, they're the probability that the algorithm uh, spits out based on its uh, mathematical algorithm probability and all that that they uh, compute, as well as the built-in dictionary that the hidden Markov model used. And using these numbers based on uh, what they call phenomes, uh, they use this to um, yeah, improve speech recognition. So what this does in the end, uh, in practical terms, is that it accounted for uh, differences in accents as well as different cadences. So in the example of potato, 
uh, this speech, uh, a software system using this hidden Markov model would be able to recognize both potato and potato. Uh, unfortunately though, even with this advancement, you still have to uh, speak very unnaturally, speak using um, pauses between words, and this is called discrete speech. So you can't speak uh, naturally like, uh, like humans would in a continuous flow, but you'd have to pause between each word. And then we have the 80s. And this is the first time that we have speech to text uh, on a computer. And uh, just a company called uh, Kurzweil Technologies, made by Ray Kurzweil on the left, just pioneered this, um, the first commercial large uh, vocabulary speech recognition software in the 80s. And then the 90s, there are more milestones then. And this is a major breakthrough where finally speech recognition uh, went from recognizing discrete speech to continuous speech. And because continuous speech is closer to human speech, it, it finally gave it a chance to become more commercial and more mainstream. So a company called Dragon uh, came out with the first uh, like really mainstream available to normal people uh, kind of so uh, speech recognition software. Uh, but not too mainstream because uh, in 1994, when it came out, the program was about $9,000. Uh, yeah, so still kind of expensive, but uh, landmark nonetheless. But uh, in the background through all this time in the 80s and the 90s, uh, neural networks was another algorithm that was being pioneered and being researched to kind of replace the hidden Markov model and just to create like a new algorithm to compute speech. And neural networks was pioneered by this man right here. His name is Jeffrey Hinton, and he's a cognitive psychologist and computer scientist, most noted for his work on artificial neural networks. And he is often called the godfather of deep learning. And uh, just to give demystify deep learning and machine learning and neural networks and just to demystify and break it down a bit, um, the type of programming that we do, uh, more functional programming where we give uh, given parameters and rules, there's an actual programmer with the expert knowledge who like kind of programs, hard programs in like, um, like rules. So if you hit a certain case, then this will happen and it tells the program explicitly what to do. Uh, deep learning or neural that uh, networks that uh, Jeffrey Hinton pioneered is a totally different type of system where the the program is dynamic. It's based on um, like models and based on the input, it can actually learn. And it's completely different than the type of uh, programs that we give it, where it's more of like an if then that we hard code ourselves. So uh, the inspiration behind neural networks is our own human brain because Jeffrey Hinton noticed. Um, you know, uh, babies basically understand languages at even the first year or like a two year old baby, but um, the computers just don't have that capability and you want to kind of mimic the brain as much as possible onto the computer. So just to give a brief summary of uh, the human brain, the human brain has 100 billion neurons or 10 to the 11th power neurons, 7, 000, around 7,000 synapses or 7,000 connections. Uh, between different neurons and at any given moment there's around 20,000 to 70,000 uh, different inputs of data between these different neurons. So uh, neural networking is basically just kind of using the same principle of uh, neurons in our brain just using that as a model for the computer and each node is just a kind of like a metaphor representation of a neuron and the connections between each node is a uh, synapse or the connection between neurons and yeah jeffrey hinton is noted as the godfather because um kind of like given the thug status in the deep learning community because he worked on this for uh decades maybe around three decades i think um and many people told him that he was wasting his time because often in within this entire time it was outpaced by the hidden markov model um, but that's only because there was a limitation in the data the neural networking how it works and machine learning deep learning all these things how it works is that it needs a lot of data to be able to learn and to be able to to grow and um, adapt well and to be able to perform 
well. And just at that time, while he was researching it, there just wasn't enough data around. And then, um, so we hit the 2000s. And this was not the advent of the internet, but I would say the first decade where the internet really um, just started gaining more speed, as well as the proliferation of the smartphone and the phone in general. And Google uh, had finally had enough information from the net, from the internet, just from different search queries, um, and like a humongous pool of human speech samples um, collected by them to be able to really use neural networks um, on a better scale. And they, it was uh, in 2008 that Google Voice Search made its way to the iPhone. And yeah, this method of neural networking, it effectively dealt with um, issues of data availability and the lack of processing ability uh, that troubled speech recognition software in the past. And then we come to 2000, the 2010s, or the decade that we are currently living in. And I would say that this is the decade of the voice assistant. And uh, you guys will probably recognize uh, these names, probably really familiar to you right now. Um, going from left to right is Apple's Siri, uh, Microsoft's Cortana, Amazon's Alexa, and Google's Google Now. And these four little uh, caricatures on the PowerPoint are basically just representations of voice assistants that these different companies have made. And uh, particularly recently, uh, Amazon's Alexa is very popular. Uh, if the image right here is of the Echo Dot, which is just a physical interface that you can use to interact with uh, the voice assistant Alexa. And it's uh, how it works is that you say Alexa and then a command. And Alexa is kind of like the invocation word that it needs to kind of like start listening. Um, it was so popular this last December, even uh, just a couple of months ago, that Amazon ran out of stock a couple of times just because of the high, high demand. Um, so maybe some of you are wondering, uh, speech recognition has been around for decades. So why is it only just now hitting the mainstream? And then the reason really is, is that deep learning has finally um, improved so much and there's so much data available um, that it's accurate enough to be useful outside of carefully controlled environments. So we could finally go commercial, even though speech recognition has been around since the 50s. So us as developers, uh, why do we care? We care because this means that we can use speech recognition in our own uh, apps, in our own um, code. So I'm going to give a quick demo of this web speech API. So this web speech API is uh, just a, yeah, as it says, a web speech API given by Google. It's free and we can use it. It goes, um, you can only use it in the Chrome browser though. And uh, Stoners, apparently, is automatically there. I don't know why. But um, if you just click this, yeah, it just works. It picks up what you're saying, and it types it out, uh, speech to text. So Google has a GitHub for this project. So it's called Web Platform Samples, and then Web Speech Demo. And then we can go to webspeechdemo.html. This single HTML page has all the logic for what you saw right here. And then if you just look at the document, it's just a bunch of CSS, HTML. The real logic to this comes from right here, WebKit Speech Recognition in Window. And what this is doing is just checking to see if the web speech recognition is in the window. And that's, um, as I said before, uh, this is only compatible with the Chrome browser. So if it is available, then it gives, uh, it invokes that uh, WebKit, WebKit speech recognition, and then it gives an object called recognition. And it's on recognition that kind of like all the magic happens. And then we can um, chain uh, functions and put things on to the recognition object or activate the the functions that are already on it so uh recognition dot continuous uh, and recognition dot interim results what these functions do is just enable um the 
the text, uh, the box here, uh, the web speech API uh, to not pause if I pause. So as I, even if I like pause for a second between words, the it would still pick up and it wouldn't just stop. And um, on start is when I start speaking, um, recognizing, set it to true. And then it also sets this GIF um, to animate while I'm speaking. So if you just see, if I click this and I'm speaking, yeah, it shifts, it animates. Um, and there are other various um, other functions on the recognition uh, object, on error, on end, just various things on result. And these are all kind of like boilerplate things that you can just um, look and take uh, for your own project. And it's all on GitHub already, um, provided by Google and available for your Chrome browser. And um, so speech recognition has come a long way and uh, just various applications we could use it for now is um, this idea of a smart home. We could just say things and it would just happen, just hooking up our, our home, our physical home with the internet. Um, yeah, also another, benefit possibility of speech recognition is uh, people with disabilities. Uh, if for some reason they can't uh, type very well, people can just use speech as an interface instead of the keyboard. Uh, also with the advent and popularization of VR, VR just lends itself to speech recognition and kind of, you just kind of expect speech recognition to just work uh, seamlessly when you're in the VR experience. Uh, just imagine Siri, just uh, a digital Siri, and you just talk to her in VR. So opportunities for developers, um, tons of opportunities for developers uh, because of machine learning and neural networks um, helping to improve the quality of speech recognition. Now is the time that it's really taking off and becoming even more mainstream. We're really in a unique period of history uh, where it's like really taking off and um, has it has a chance to integrate integrate with a lot of new technologies um, like VR. However, seamless experience. Uh, contribute to experience to help contribute to accuracy and also just use your imagination and creativity for how you can integrate speech recognition to whatever app that you want to create in the future. So um, for the future, maybe we'll come to a point where like Iron Man, we can come home and uh, our own personal assistant, voice assistant can welcome us. But yeah, thank you.